E, para iniciar, eu gostaria de compor a mesa de abertura. Então, eu gostaria de chamar é, o senhor Henrique Vasques, que representa a OPAS, é, e Tizia Laris Goitia, representando a Organização Mundial de Saúde, e Patrícia Fernanda Toledo, representando o Ministério da Saúde. E você está aqui. Gostaria de começar, então, convidando o senhor Henrique Vasques para poder falar em nome da, da OPAS. Obrigado. Obrigado, Walter. É, em nome de, no nome de, do doutor Joaquim Molina, que é o representante da OPAS OMS no Brasil, é, saudar a todos os participantes neste segundo seminário internacional sobre qualidade de saúde e segurança do paciente. Em particular, queria... Saludar o, o Dr. Walter Mendes, da, da Fundação Osvaldo Cruz, eh, a Patrícia Fernandes, da Anvisa, que é em representação do, do, ministro, do ministro Alexandre Padilla, do Ministro de Saúde do Brasil, a minha colega Edicia Laris Goitia, eh, da OMS, da área de qualidade de, de, de segurança do paciente, de qualidade de atenção, um, com a que volto a coincidir depois de, de muitos anos. Eh, quando trabalhamos os dois na Espanha, em muitos anos, nos reencontramos hoje de novo. Foi uma, uma boa alegria para nós. É, saudar e agradecer a presença das instituições, a ISQA, a The Health Foundation, a Proqualis, os participantes internacionais de Escócia, de México, dos Estados Unidos, e os, os participantes brasileiros das, que representam a Secretaria de Atenção à Saúde, a SAS, a Secretaria Executiva do Ministério da Saúde, a FEMIG, a Agência Nacional de Saúde Suplementar, a ANS, o Fiocruz, as Secretarias Municipais de Saúde e as Secretarias Estaduais de Saúde. É, para nós, para a OPA, sempre é um orgulho ter, ter presença de, de, de nível internacional e de, de nível estadual de, de, de Brasil nesta reunião, a, a nossa casa e a vossa casa. É, sempre está aberta este tipo de reunião, se conta com todo o nosso apoio, contou com todo o nosso apoio, conta e vai seguir contando com todo o nosso apoio em coordenação com a, com a OMS. Nada mais, é, sejam, sejam bem-vindos, desfrutem de dois dias de, de boa reunião, de bom trabalho. E, por favor, se hidratam os de fora, porque a seca em Brasília é muito forte. Estava comentando agora com a companheira que se vai hidratando, porque realmente é, é impactante o, o fator climático aqui em Brasília. Sejam bem-vindos e muito, muito obrigado a todos. Eu, eu que agradeço e gostaria de cumprimentar Henrique Vasques e, através dele, cumprimentar todos os funcionários da OPAS que foram extremamente gentis, é? extremamente parceiros na organização desse, desse seminário. Né? Eu esqueci de me apresentar inicialmente, né? meu nome é Walter Mendes, eu sou é, da Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, membro do, 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 do Proqualis e membro do Comitê Nacional de Implantação do Programa de Segurança do Paciente. E fui, sou, faço parte da organização desse, desse seminário. Eu gostaria também de, de cumprimentar e agradecer a presença é, de uma pessoa que já esteve conosco, Etizia, que representa a Organização Mundial de Saúde, já esteve na, na Fiocruz, numa roda de debates a respeito da implantação é, de políticas e de programas, e de pesquisa especialmente na área de segurança do paciente. A gente desenvolveu um contato muito bom e permanece até hoje. Eu agradeço muito a, sua, a presença dela. É, como também... É, agradeço a, a, e cumprimento Patrícia Fernandes Toledo, que é uma companheira também do comitê, é, é uma pessoa da diretoria da, da Anvisa e que aqui representando o ministro, é, num momento importante em que o ministério lança um, um programa nacional de, de segurança do paciente 
e esse seminário se insere nesse projeto, nessa perspectiva, nesse processo. Né? Esse seminário tem uma, uma importância muito grande nesse desenvolvimento. E por isso nós vamos ter hoje duas mesas redondas. A primeira mesa redonda ela vai ser agora de manhã, a gente provavelmente não vai ter tempo para o debate, né? porque os, os convidados vão ter 20 minutos cada um para poder apresentar, mas na parte da tarde a gente vai ter é, um tempo de debate. Né? Os, as pessoas que, viriam, que virão agora de manhã para a primeira mesa seria a Tracy Cooper, que é a presidente do International Society for Quality and Health Care, que ainda não chegou, a gente está aguardando que ela chegue, ela está vindo de um avião para cá, é a própria Tizia, que vai falar sobre o ponto de vista da Organização Mundial de Saúde, a professora Cláudia Travassos, minha colega da Fundação Oswaldo Cruz e responsável pelo Proqualis, pelo Central, Centro Colaborador Proqualis. E à tarde, é, bom, desculpe, e Jonathan, é Jonathan Riddle Bamber, que é da Health Foundation, que é uma instituição inglesa e que tem um contato muito bom, desenvolvido com o e seria muito importante ouvi-los, ouvir essa, essa experiência dessa instituição. À tarde, nós teríamos a presença de Jason Leite, que vem falar sobre o programa da Escócia, Segurança do Paciente, é uma implantação importante. É Odete Sarabia, que vem do México, para poder falar para a gente como é que está o desenvolvimento dessa discussão no México. É, e Charles Joseph McKinnon, que também é, vem falar da experiência nos Estados Unidos, ele que foi uma pessoa, pessoa que trabalhou no Medicare, no Medicare Medicaid Services. É, infelizmente, nós não pudemos contar com Catherine Galton, que era a representante do Canadian Patient Safety Institute, mas ela não conseguiu visto, não teve condições de vir para a gente aqui, a gente iria compor com ela a mesa da tarde. Mas, enfim, essa, essa mesa, depois dessa mesa, a gente vai ter oportunidade do, dos debates, né? e acho que a gente vai conseguir fazer um bom seminário, e eu saúdo a todos, e gostaria que todos se sentissem à vontade para a gente poder aproveitar muito a presença desses convidados internacionais para a gente poder debater com eles e tirar dúvidas a respeito de elementos importantes que foram desenvolvidos em vários países de desenvolvimento do programa de saúde, de segurança do paciente, qualidade de saúde e segurança do paciente. Obrigado e bom seminário para todos. Gostaria de passar então a palavra para Itzia Lazigrotia. Eu falei seu nome, seu sobrenome corretamente? Uh, muito bem. <risos> um, uh, bom dia, um, bom dia, Dr. Uh, Walter Mendes, uh, Dra. Fernandes de Ambisa, uh, my colleague from Pajo, uh, Dr. Vasquez, uh, representatives from Mexico, U.S., Scotland, and colleagues from the Health Foundation, Isqua and other institutions, especially colleagues from Fiocruz and Proqualis. It is a pleasure for me to be here today. It is an honor to represent the patient safety program of the World Health Organization and, and to give uh, this address as well on behalf of Dr. Edward Kelly, the director of the program, who could not be here today. I would like to mention, and I would like to, to put the context of this initiative within one, the, one of the new goals, priorities of the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Margaret Tan. She just issued uh, a new global health goal, the attainment of universal health coverage as as a theme, as a goal to expand access and equity in the delivery of health care. Within this goal, patient safety and quality is an essential component because expanding access of unsafe care is dangerous and this should not happen. So it is on the hands of all of us to improve and increase patient safety and quality. So, because of this, I, I welcome and congratulate the Minister of Health, 
and the Brazilian institutions for this initiative, which will be essential to attain to, to improve universal health coverage in Brazil. I would also like to say that Brazil and recognize that Brazil is, is one of the major global health actors today. So the example of this initiative, the, the attainments, the goals, so the achievements that, that you will make with this initiative would be an example for many other countries in the world. So with this, I would like to congratulate you again and to uh, offer the collaboration of WHO to learn from your achievements and to, and to work with you. So thank you very much. My apologies for not uh, being able to speak in Portuguese. And uh, I'm looking forward to this seminar and to learn from the achievements and from the discussions of Brazil. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Zia. Passar a palavra agora para minha colega Patrícia Fernanda Toledo. Bom dia a todos. Quero cumprimentar a doutora Itzia, doutor Henrique, doutor Walter Mendes. Quero aqui justificar a minha presença nesta mesa. Na plateia há pessoas com muito mais responsabilidade do que a minha função. E eu gostaria de justificar que o doutor Alexandre Padilha designou para o doutor Diceu Barbano que aqui estivesse e a presidenta Dilma convocou o doutor Diceu Barbano. Então, eu não preciso justificar mais do que isso, porque que ele não está aqui. Né? Não é pela, pela, por demérito ao evento, ao contrário. Ele pediu que aqui estivéssemos representando. A diretoria da Anvisa estará aqui representada durante o evento. O doutor Ivo Bucareschi, que é um dos nossos diretores, está chegando, deve estar no aeroporto. E eu, como representante, uma das representantes da Anvisa no comitê para a implantação do Programa Nacional de Segurança do Paciente, fiquei com a grata satisfação de fazer as vezes aqui da agência nesta abertura. Então, eu quero dar as boas-vindas a todos, dizer que esse esforço tripartite do Estado brasileiro, do Ministério da Saúde, da Agência Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária e da Fundação Instituto Oswaldo Cruz, é, vem dar, tentar dar resposta para aquilo que já o mundo já clama há algum tempo, que é trazer mais segurança e menos dano para os nossos pacientes, para os nossos usuários do nosso Sistema Único de Saúde. Então, duas boas-vindas a todos, bem-vindos à Brasília, que ainda aqui não é, bem-vindos a todos os colegas da Anvisa, do Ministério da Saúde, de instituições de saúde, de universidades e do próprio comitê que aqui estão, e um excelente evento a todos nós. Obrigada. Obrigado, Patrícia. Eu gostaria de pedi-la que permanecesse na mesa e convocasse a próxima mesa. Obrigado. Bem, a primeira mesa redonda deste evento é a mesa redonda Qualidade em Saúde e Segurança do Paciente, Aspectos Conceituais. Eu gostaria de convidar aqui, por ordem, na ordem inversa do que está colocado na programação, até por, por uma questão de pioneirismo do tema aqui no Brasil, gostaria de convidar a nossa colega, a doutora Cláudia Travassos, que é coordenadora-geral do Centro Colaborador para a Qualidade do Cuidado e a Segurança do Paciente do Proqualis, da Fundação Oswaldo Cruz. Gostaria de convidar o Dr. Jonathan Hilda Bamber, que é gerente de pesquisa da The Health Foundation. E, novamente, a doutora Itzia Laris Goitia, que é a coordenadora de pesquisa e gestão do conhecimento do Programa de Segurança do Paciente da Organização Mundial de Saúde.
Doutora Tracy, já chegou? Não? Assim que chegar, ela acompanha a mesa conosco, então. Eu gostaria de que os, os componentes da mesa fizessem as suas primeiras considerações e aí nós já passamos para as palestras de cada um. Doutora Cláudia. Bom dia a todos. É, eu queria primeiro dizer assim da minha felicidade de que a gente esteja ah, finalmente realizando, eu sei que é o segundo evento, que já expressa a importância que esse tema vem é, é, conseguindo é, atingir, quer dizer, no país, no Ministério da Saúde, na Anvisa. É, e agradecer muito a, a, o aceite de nosso convite aos nossos convidados internacionais, porque eu acho que essa troca com, com instituições e países que já vêm desenvolvendo a políticas a, a, nessa área há algum tempo, certamente é, nos ajudará muito em... em é, procurar caminhos mais, mais férteis né? e mais é, rápidos para é, é, melhorarmos a qualidade do cuidado e a segurança do paciente no nosso país. Doutor Jonathan. Obrigado. Ah, eu gostaria de... Ah, Agradecer o Ministério da Saúde para o convite a, a, a falar hoje. A, 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 obrigado. E eu, eu falo um pouco português, mas meu inglês é bem meu. <risos> <risos> ah, então, eu vou, eu vou falar em inglês, em inglês ah, agora. Um, um momento, porque eu não tendo isso e preciso ter uma apresentação no... Ah. Apresentação, por favor. Pode ser, pode ser. O doutor Jonathan será o primeiro. É o terceiro, não You can, you can. Okay. Um, you can stay there. You can stay there, okay. please. I'm going to talk today briefly about the work in quality and safety within the UK. Uh -huh. <laughs> I could talk without the slides for a second. So, um, by the end of the session, we're going to, um, I'm going to have um, a brief discussion over quality and safety in the UK and talking about my organization which is the Health Foundation which has been working to uh, improve quality and safety in the UK over the last 10 years. Well, okay. And hopefully provide a little bit of uh, reflections uh, which may have relevance for the Brazilian context. Um, and also I'm hoping to, for the rest of this session, to learn about uh, the experience of quality and safety in Brazil to bring back to the UK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my organization uh, that I work for. So we're an independent charity working in healthcare. So we have no connections with, uh, no formal connections with governments or any um, uh, agency with uh, particular agendas. 
Our mission is to improve the quality of healthcare within the UK. And the UK is including the four main countries of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Our work includes international links with major quality improvement organizations like the Institute of Healthcare Improvement in the US, and more recently with Proqualis, uh, part of the Fondação Osvaldo Cruz. Uh, we also do some international work, but it's mainly UK-based. All the information I'm talking about today is available on our website, which you can see at the top of this presentation, www.health.org.uk. Unfortunately, this is all in English, but we've been working with uh, Claudio and Camilla Lujoho from Proqualis to get translations into Portuguese of some of our major publications, which will be available soon. So we have um, been focusing on quality and safety since 2003 and have a wealth of experience of some of the things which can be helpful for quality and some of the lessons that we've learned on things that we probably would have done differently. I've been working for the Health Foundation for uh, six years now, um, managing, commissioning and disseminating research uh, on safety and quality. And my main role is around knowledge translation, so working on how evidence from this work can be relevant to healthcare professionals and policy makers within the UK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the National Health Service in the UK to provide context for those who are not familiar. My apologies for those who know the NHS. So this was created in 1948 as universal free health care for everybody in the UK. It's paid for by a tax on employment and is still largely funded through this employment process. So if you receive any health care within the UK, then you don't have to pay for it. The four countries in the UK manage their healthcare separately. I know that Jason Leach is going to be talking about uh, the Scottish experience. So taking an example of the amount of money spent, uh, and these numbers are a loose translation from pounds into reais. In the NHS, we're currently spending over 300 billion reais a year on our health system which translates to approximately 7,000 reais per head for every individual, which is considerably more than the figures that I, I currently have on Brazil. But interestingly, it's equivalent to the money spent on American healthcare system, which is only providing partial coverage uh, through Medicaid or Medi uh, Medicare. Uh, our history around quality and safety has a long history. Um, that one of the biggest early examples is the work that Florence Nightingale was doing in the 19th century, looking at healthcare associated infections. And if you look at the history of quality and safety within the UK, there is a regular system of major failings in healthcare systems that the uh, media and governments feel there is a need to have a response and change systems, uh, often associated with infection control or maternal and child health. <clears throat> What's interesting about this is that it's relatively unusual for change to take place that actively improves healthcare but there are some positive examples. A recent example I'll pick up is uh, two main publications, uh, one from the US which has made uh, a seminal change in uh, safety and quality uh, to Err is Human from the Institute of Medicine in 1999. And within the UK, uh, the chief medical officer of the NHS was involved in this publication, an organization with a memory. And this instigated large-scale changes in patient safety, in particular, and quality. So the Health Foundation's approach, we spend 
approximately 100 million hayais per year on quality improvement and research. The important point here is that although most of that money is on uh, improvement initiatives and uh, development funding for improvements, practical improvements in safety, there is also a fundamental evidence and knowledge generation aspect to this. So we work on trying to build a picture from the best evidence of um, areas that are necessary to focus on, important to focus on, from research and also expert advice. We fund innovative ideas into um, improving patient safety, which have the potential, but there's a large failure rate there deliberately to fund innovative ideas to pick up some new, new approaches which haven't been used before. We focus on large-scale demonstration programs, which uh, we involve fundamentally key people from uh, governments and uh, healthcare professionals, doctors and other clinicians, to ensure that as that work is developing, uh, potential for spread and sustainability at scale. So with the money that we're spending compared to government funding on improvements, it's relatively small, but we have the potential with our independence to fund projects that other people are not. Key to our strategy has been doing two things. Firstly, targeting selectively. So around quality improvement, we could be spending all our money focusing on a range of aspects on uh, equity, on access, on safety, and spreading very thin. But we're focusing our resources deliberately on a few things in order to gain traction and for us to become experts in the field so we can help promote that work. And secondly, this combination of research and knowledge generation with practically changing on the ground. So we try not to publish, to fund research which is just for research sake that has no application into improving patient safety. So I will go into a little bit more detail over those two strategies to illustrate that point. So with our independence we can focus on specific aspects which may have relevance in five years time or may have relevance at the moment. Back in 2003, we recognized there was a need to focus on capacity and capability of improvements. This is something that we continue to fund and is continually important. Uh, and for example, Jason Leach uh, is a colleague who um, we funded in 2005 uh, as a quality improvement fellow. And look at him now, he's presenting at a <laughs> Brazilian conference. Um, we're also fundamentally involved in introducing quality improvement methods into the UK health system. So ideas from industry uh, built upon uh, Deming's work and other manufacturing approaches to improvements, uh, including lean methods and plan, do, study, act cycles. An example of this is our work in patient safety which in 2003 focused on only four areas, but working with the Institutes of Healthcare Improvements picked major safety areas of venous thromboembolism, of uh, infection control, et cetera, in order to make active changes on the ground. When this was sh showing success, this developed up to 24 sites across England and Scotland and Wales, and has since become integral to the health systems within the four countries. For example, the um, Thousand Lives campaign in Wales and the Scottish healthcare system. So the funding in 2003 was something that central government wasn't doing, but by 2008 or 9, this was being picked up by others and we can move and focus on other areas. Importantly, we've also focused on engaging professional uh, organizations with the topics that they were interested in at the time. So back in 2003 to 4, there was a lot of interest in clinical audits, which 
is uh, an important technique, but not necessarily the only technique in imp improvement. But because the doctors were focused and willing to engage on this topic, we worked with them on that topic. And this is very important. Moving on, we recognize the important, uh, importance of cost and the relationship with quality. So we often have a moral position of saying it's important to improve quality. But the connection on how much that may save or may cost the health system is complicated. A good example of this is uh, work that we've been doing with the London School of Economics to uh, use economic modeling techniques but combined with community participation methods to make decisions on which funding you should reduce and which funding you should increase. More recently, we've been focused much more on person-centered care, so issues of how both clinicians and people with, say, a long-term condition like diabetes can manage their care better. This is something that in 2008 to 9, that the UK health system was uh, interested in the ideas but not willing to invest large amounts of money in. By 2012, this is something that is building traction. Um, our approach to safety has changed to uh, still recognize the importance of harm, but also recognizing <coughs> there are aspects of reliability and uh, recognizing hazards, so future harm, that needs to have more commitment within the UK. And more recently, we've been dealing around improving capacity and engagement in a science of improvements, which I'll go to, into in a little bit, in a few slides' time. So this aspect of uh, combining best evidence and uh, improvement to patients is extremely important. Any improvement work we do in order to uh, save lives and improve patient care needs to have an aspect of understanding if they have, it has made a difference, but fundamentally also why it's made a difference using uh, more qualitative techniques, social science techniques of understanding what the mechanisms of change are. Any of our funding of improvement, we make sure that around 10 to 15 percent of any funding is allocated towards evaluation. And we've been working a lot with researchers such as Professor Mary Dixon Woods from Leicester University to look into how to ensure we have these explanations. Uh, a good example of this is uh, looking at the work that Professor Peter Pronovost was doing on reducing infections of central venous catheters in the US, where he showed um, significant reductions in infection rates. Now, a simple explanation of this is around that it was the technical interventions that caused this change, the introduction of a checklist, the use of uh, particular trolleys which have the um, uh, available equipment there at the time, the wearing of a mask and a coat. However, further work into this has been showing that the likelihood is, is it's a combination of behavior change with these technical interventions. Without that extra explanation, it's very difficult to take this information into a Brazilian context or a UK context to say what may work in our situation. The other side of the coin of this work is the importance to develop uh, a more rigorous and uh, replicable method of quality improvement. So some of the techniques in quality improvement have had really real successes but they're quite difficult techniques and we've been trying to build capacity and engagement in improvement research through um, funding PhDs and postdoctoral fellowships and um, promoting the use of evidence through ownership of the BMJ Quality and Safety Journal and also the provision of a research scan which sweeps over 40,000 journals on improvement to provide a uh, snapshots of 50 interesting journals for people to access. 
So my reflections on this um, are that if there were three points that I push from my experience to take from the work we've done in improvements, and incidentally this is built upon uh, a publication called Overcoming Challenges in Quality Improvements, is that any improvement must be relevant and engage professionals and policy audiences. Recently within the UK, um, uh, we have published work on measurements and monitoring of patient safety. I commissioned this work um, at a time when the environment in the UK needed to have an overview of potential measures and metrics. But while hiring leading academics to invest in this research, we're also engaging leaders of healthcare in England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. So once this is published, there's potential for that to be integrated into those systems. Secondly, there's importance of adapting solutions for specific situations. It's very tempting to provide uh, single messages of this is the best evidence of what you should do to reduce adverse events and then make everybody do that. However, there is uh, aspects of local histories, the policy context in a situation, and also the expertise of the professionals on the ground that needs to be taken into consideration with any improvements. So with flexibility to adapt the solutions, you have more chance of achieving success. I'll quickly go through uh, an example that illustrates some of the difficulties with um, guidelines and providing um, one single, this is the way you should do this. Now in a relatively small hospital in a town in the UK called Bristol, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Tim Draycott, looked at the fact that for obstetrics, for maternity care, there were 328 different separate guideline documents on how to deliver a baby. On an average of 10 pages for each one, that's 35,000 pages of guidance on how to deliver a baby. And then people were asking, why is this not implemented? It's impossible. So with uh, annual training programs where everybody within the units, regardless of their seniority or juniority, that they have to be engaged in training programs of looking at how do we, in, how do we implement best practice for our context, for our situation. They've achieved the lowest APGAR rates in the known literature. So it, this isn't easy, but needing the time to adapt, to adapt your work is important. And finally, a cautionary message around considering the side effects of change. Sometimes you think you're going to do something and you may achieve something else. The something else might be good, but it often is different. And I'll quickly go through a quick example. So, in the UK, in 2003, the National Health Service uh, quite appropriately thought it would be good to learn from aviation who had a system of incident reporting where they would collect incidents on risks or harm to people flying and have a rapid response system to investigate that. Now, across the global aviation field, they were picking up approximately 10,000 incidents, which although that's a lot, that was still possible for people to investigate each incident, look for the root causes, and implement changes. Within the English National Health Service alone, this reporting system was collecting 1.4 million incidents every year. And what happened with that is it was impossible to investigate the, those incidents. There was too much information and the system became 
a research tool, which is an interesting research tool and has value, but was not doing what it was intended to do, and there was no ability for improvements. So even with good intentions, it's very difficult. It's important to reflect on um, how you can uh, try to do something, and maybe it'll end up being something else, and then you may need to adapt as you go along. So those are my final uh, reflections, and I'd just like to um, thank uh, Professor Claudia Travasos and uh, Camilla Lajolo for some support in uh, producing this presentation, and other colleagues from the UK that I've drawn from their research. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Dr. Jonathan. Passo agora a palavra para a doutora Itzier. Doutora Itzier, que é coordenadora de pesquisa e gestão do conhecimento do Programa de Segurança do Paciente da Organização Mundial de Saúde, para nos trazer as suas considerações. Okay. Bom dia. Eh, señoras y señores, eh, uh, hablaré inglés, mis, mis excusas por no uh, poder hablar portugués. Um, I, I would like, um, well, first of all, again, uh, thank you all for giving me this opportunity to be here with you and to introduce the work of the patient safety program uh, of the World Health Organization. I, I have put together a presentation in three parts, perhaps. The first one, explaining the why uh, WHO um, took this issue as an important area of work. A second one, covering briefly the main programs of the main strategies or initiatives of WHO over the past few years. And then I will finalize highlighting the new directions that uh, our, uh, the program is now facing for the years to come. So perhaps first as a start, uh, I thought of uh, just uh, starting from from the stage where I think most of the healthcare professionals and most of the people who work in the health sector is. Uh, and this is in the belief of the wonders of medicine, the belief of the power of science and of the many things that medicine can do. Just an, an example of one of the, of, of the new things, the facial transplantation as a new a horizon, the many things that medicine can do and, and does uh, usually. And, and this is where most of us is and believe all the time. But at the same time, and this is what it is important to recognize, is that medicine and healthcare also do harm. And this is a slide showing the average of infections associated to healthcare or infections that are developed while somebody is in a Muslim hospitals, but a little bit of everywhere. About 7% patients in Europe in that study that has a few, it's a few years old already. But this is another one that it was, uh, it was uh, performed a couple of years ago looking at transitional and developing countries. Here is Brazil as well. And uh, the, the average is about 15% in all these countries of patients uh, who um, end or get an infection where, where they are in, in the institution. Another data comes from a study that was uh, coordinated by WHO in, Amer in Latin America on a few countries, and Odette Saravia, who's here with us, she was director of the, of the study in Mexico. And um, just to highlight, probably you, you know this study, but to highlight that um, what it came was that on average, on a single day, uh, one out of 10 patients who is admitted in a hospital uh, has at that, that day uh, the consequences of a, an incident, of a patient safety, of an adverse event. On average, on that study, two out of 10 patients 
uh, suffer an incident while they were in the hospital during the entire hospitalization. And you can see this, see whether this, I know how it works, yes. You can see that a quarter of those incidents was associated to death, the death of the patients and or permanent disability. So this is serious. Another example uh, about injection safety, I don't know to what extent this is a problem in Brazil, but in many countries, over prescription of injections is one of the major problems. It's, 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 it, it is associated to about 1.3 million premature deaths and an enormous amount of, of money wasted uh, uh, associated with those infections. So at the end, what it is important is to recognize that an enormous, an inadmissible number of patients suffer while they go through healthcare, while they were attending healthcare to get better and they got worse. And this is the main reason why WHO took this area of work as an important, as an important program. Um, let me, before going to WHO, reflect a little bit on what it is behind the harm. And many of them, um, and many of them uh, um, one understands that the reasons for those situations to happen is because, of course, something went wrong, and that something that went wrong might be associated to one person or two persons committing something that it was not proper. Uh, while looking at the, the causes that are behind, there are many issues that are not related to a single person or, or a single person's issues that have to do with how the system is organized. And you can see here a list of areas that were considered as global priority areas to improve patient safety by a panel of experts of WHO a few years ago. And you can see that are issues that have to do with substandard drugs, for example. This is a main prevalent problem in, in many, many, many countries in the world. Issues having to do with communications and coordination of staff and oh, staff, healthcare personnel between them and with patients. Uh, issues having to do with knowledge, competence, training of personnel, and many others, as you can see here, and safe injection and blood practices, for example, having to do with blood transfusion and how, uh, how these are being uh, conducted. Uh, poor safety culture, uh, the fact that devices and processes uh, don't contemplate the human factors approach and the risks to mistakes. Uh, issues having to do with misdiagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. So this is to say that what it is essential in, in developing patient safety programs is to recognize the systems approach versus the sometimes more easily way to tackle this issue, which is to blame individuals. Important to recognize that when humans fail, as this sentence uh, expresses, it is related to problems with health systems, tasks, and processes, the way that they are designed, rather than with individuals. So with this in mind, uh, WHO set up a special program, the Patient Safety Program. A few years ago, actually, it, it followed a resolution of the World Health Assembly in 2002, and it was set up as a, as a special program in 2004 with the vision to uh, promote that every patient receives safe health care and with the mission, the mandate, to try to accelerate successful interventions and to try to share learning across different institutions around the world. That was our mission. Uh, how, how WHO developed uh, its work plan? Um, our, our main goal, and WHO, for those of you who don't know very much, it, it is uh, one of these uh, United Nations agencies with 
a brokering role, a role of bringing together expertise from the world and share it to, the, to others. And, 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 and an important political role. So one of, of, the main, um, one of the main actions was trying to put pacing safety on the political agenda of the policy makers. And uh, this, we've worked uh, with our colleagues, with many of you uh, who are here today, trying to advocate, trying to present patient safety in at the World Health Assembly, at the, at the table of the policy makers, trying to engage political commitment. And, this, and these pictures represent actually ministerial pledges that took place uh, over a course of several years around one of our main programs in healthcare, and there are several ministers there with our uh, Sir Liam Donaldson, our, the special uh, advisor for patient safety at WHO. An important program that I will mention later uh, on at the end is uh, about trying to establish high-level political engagement on on what we call it, we have set it up as a partnership program, trying to bring uh, countries at the beginning from Europe, and you can see there, there are color England, France, and Switzerland, and, and twinning them with other countries in, in, in Africa, in this particular case, to try to leverage uh, African countries through hospital to hospital partnership. I will explain a little bit more uh, later on, this is an important initiative to improve patient safety where there's uh, more need in, in African hospitals. Um, importantly for WHO is a, a strengthening patient engagement and actually bringing the patient's voice into the political and the policy debate. And uh, WHO set up a, a program of work called Patients for Patient Safety, where at the moment there is a network of about 200 patient safety champions in the world. These are patients who have gone through, most of them, through, through patient safety incidents and who had become important advocates for patient safety in their own countries and in the world in international forum. Of course, WHO has developed, and, and this is something that I'm sure you, you, you're very uh, aware of, uh, big global campaigns to try to bring engagement through advocacy around evidence-based solutions, and that is important, to recognize the evidence based of this. In the first, what it was called Global Patient Safety Challenge, it was around uh, promoting uh, health, uh, hand hygiene uh, in healthcare, and it came out with the production of global, sorry, global guy, oh, uh, where, am, where am I? Sorry, I'm going, I'm going uh, back. I'm back, okay. Um, it was around um, pro, uh, producing a global guidelines for hand hygiene and, and, and this uh, a scheme as well that is uh, evidence-based, has proven to be, to facilitate hand hygiene and actually uh, WHO invited uh, countries, ministers of health to pledge commitment. The pictures I showed before came from this from this program, and now in, in, there are about uh, more than 100 countries in the world who have all, all signed commitment and are running uh, national campaigns. And followed to that, um, uh, one of the uh, most known, I would say, innovations in healthcare was the production of the safe surgery checklist and actually its rollout as well throughout the world, engaging. Um, professional societies related to surgery to use it, and with that to improve, uh, to reduce uh, complications around surgery and, and mortality. WHO has developed as well uh, other tools and a number of resources that you can find in the WHO website. Most of them are in English, some of them are 
in Spanish and other languages. And actually, I would have to mention and uh, at WHO there is an, a, an important group called the ePortuguese Network, and I know the Ministry of Health of Brazil is a strong collaborator of that network, uh, which is doing an enormous effort and a tremendous job in, in translating many of these resources into Portuguese and facilitating them to uh, countries of uh, Portuguese-speaking Portuguese -speaking countries. And I would like to mention this, which is an, a very important uh, direction of work um, with the goal of spreading knowledge. And I would like to thank and, and recognize the, the collaboration of Fiocruz and as well of the University of Nova Lisboa uh, to run, they run, and Claudia is here, uh, and Walter Mendes and Monica Martins who collaborated on, on, on this important uh, project. This was an online course on um, introduction to research, which had been run originally in English and in French, and Spanish later than this, and actually with the support of your Cruz and the University of Nova Lisboa, um, were able to broadcast this eight-week course to about, I believe, this is, this is only a, a, a slide of registrants. Uh, uh, I think don't look um, uh, at, the, at the level of the columns. So there were about 5,000, 4,000 uh, attendants to this course. But what is important, of course, most of the attendants were from Brazil because it is the largest Portuguese-speaking country. But I think what it is extremely important is that they were sites. What you can see here is the number of sites who, which were connected at the time. And what is important is that they were sites from many countries in the world, countries and, and, and attendants, which could not have had the opportunity to participate in a course of these characteristics otherwise. And this is a picture of one of the sessions in, in Luanda, in Angola. You can see that in one single site, there were about 25 people or so listening to the presentation. So that was an extraordinary piece of, of work and of collaboration, and, and thanks again. So I will finish. Uh, what I, ha I presented is a little bit of the main directions forward of, of what WHO has been promoting so far. And I think I would like to finish what, with what we have ahead, and, and we are at the moment trying actually to design and, and, and design at this moment. Perhaps starting um, with uh, what I mentioned uh, at the beginning in, in the introduction, uh, Mar Dr. Margaret Chan, the Director General of WHO, has issued a new goal, a new global health goal for the next few years. And this is about uh, promoting and trying to achieve universal health coverage. And this is an attempt, as I say, to expand access and equity in, in health services delivery, but of course, in, in, in trying to achieve uh, universal health coverage, improving patient safety and quality is paramount. Otherwise, uh, the world will be doing more harm than good, probably. Uh, so, our new strategic areas, and, and actually we are working on them, these, these, are, these are not yet completely defined. Uh, I have to say that we are in the middle of a new reorganization uh, based on this, uh, on the universal health coverage framework, and uh, probably by the end of 2013, I think we'll be able to, to, to to publish our new strategy. So far, what we are um, contemplating are uh, these uh, areas as, as, as new directions, um, considering and defining what would be the role, uh, the agenda of uh, safety and quality for universal health coverage, recognizing the importance that aging and chronic uh, conditions are the main challenges for healthcare 
and we think that it is ex extremely important to have that as, uh, as, as our main drive and to think through how safety and quality need to be to, to tackle the care of the, chronic, the chronically ill and of the elderly. And in expanding a universal health care, primary care, a, and, and home care a, acquires a very important role. This is an area that so far uh, has been a little bit behind the development of patient safety and it's very important that we'll be able to give a response to what that means. Among these, well, I will go through these. Our, 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 our tasks would be to provide leadership, bring knowledge and provide solutions, and most importantly, engage uh, healthcare actors in the world to facilitate, to learn from and facilitate improvement. So we have ahead of what I mentioned before, perhaps I would like to highlight what is in blue here. Uh, among our goals is to be able to produce a report, this is only a report, uh, what we call a World Health Report, on safety and quality uh, will have a different name, but the goal uh, would be to advocate to, for WHO to, to, to bring a strong advocacy tool for patient safety and quality. Hopefully, this report, uh, the, the, our, our schedule is that it will be for late 2014, we're hoping. Um, we are advancing on trying to define uh, the, the content of a safety agenda for primary care, which again it would be uh, for the future, uh, for, for, for next year and, and the following one. A very important uh, area of work I did not mention on when I reflect on the achievements of the past few years, but it started a few years ago, is about education. And, and WHO developed already a, a multi-professional guide, we call it, uh, for, for uh, education and patient safety for the multi-professions that are related to healthcare. Our goal is to expand the use and implementation of, of, this, of this guide and to complement the guide with a suite of different tools that could facilitate and expand education. What is clear is that it's extremely important that healthcare workers, professionals, clinicians, understand patient safety and quality, and it is essential to improve education. And importantly, uh, WHO is at this moment working with its partners in the development of a new guide for leaders this time, not for clinicians, but for those who governed healthcare, for professionals from ministries of health, from health authorities, uh, from the administration. Of course, WHO will continue developing tools, and I would like to introduce one which is about to be released, hopefully, in 2015, and the, it is a new checklist for safe childbirth. Uh, this is a checklist that it has been already produced to the proof of concept. It's been uh, developed. Uh, and at the moment, it is part of what we have called the WHO Safe Childbirth Checklist Collaboration. What this means is that uh, WHO is inviting anybody any institution, any academia, groups, NGOs, who would like to test the implementation of this checklist in their different context, to do it and to share the learnings with WHO. Our hope is that by 2014, um, we together, collectively, will have collected sufficient information on, the, uh, on how the checklist behaves in different contexts. At the moment, this collaboration was issued a few months ago. There are about 12, 13 institutions from different countries of the world, and there is one 
a hospital from Brazil as well that is part of the collaboration and uh, they're translating it. Actually, uh, I should mention again, our colleagues from the ePortuguese network have translated the materials into Portuguese, and they are available to any, again, any institution who would like to join and collaborate and, and share the learnings with us. Our hope uh, is that uh, 2015, uh, by the time, by last year of the Millennium Development Goals, WHO will be in a position to issue and publicly release the checklist for wide use all over the world. Uh, promoting the patient safety culture is uh, one of our main goals, and uh, WHO will launch another global campaign in 2014, this time around medication safety. At the moment, uh, they we're trying to pull together the evidence based around different interventions. And uh, by the beginning of 2014, uh, we'll be able to identify a topic area and after uh, issue a, a global campaign inviting healthcare institutions to join this initiative. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, uh, when I talked about the partnership program, uh, fostering engagement is um, among the main goals of our institution. Not only in, in the African partnership program that I introduced before, uh, was born with the intent to bring knowledge from and expertise from institutions in the north, let's say, in very developed countries, in England at first, and then France and, and other countries, and, and twin them and, and, and exchange lessons with institutions in the south. Well, it becomes evident as the partnerships have progressed, is that learning goes in both directions, from the north to the south and from the south to the north. And that where it is important is to engage partnerships and alliances in any di directions, south to south, north to north, any country for any country. This is, this is our goal for the, next, uh, for the next few years. And I would like to mention on this that at the moment, and again, it's an opportunity to recognize the collaboration of Brazilian institutions and a few crews and proqualis uh, in particular uh, to facilitate a dialogue at this moment to, to see uh, to explore the possibility of engaging uh, between Brazilian institutions and African institutions uh, for, for this important initiative. This is something that we're working now and that hopefully will be a reality, a reality very soon. And, uh, and, with this, uh, and with this, I would like to finalize, uh, perhaps inviting you all here to, to work with uh, WHO, to share your learnings with WHO uh, and facilitate spreading uh, the lessons fostering patient safety culture and uh, with the collaboration of, of all of us to improve safety and quality and expand or achieve universal health care to, well, to what we can between all of us. So thank you very much. With this, I finish. Thank you. Muito obrigada, doutora Itzia. Quanta coisa né, para ser feita na, na área de segurança do paciente. Gostaríamos de convidar agora a doutora Trace. Doutora Trace Cooper, por favor. Welcome. You can start your presentation now, please. Thank you, bonjour. Uh, thank you very much um, to colleagues on the, on the front desk. And uh, a slight apology for us 
being late, uh, we, myself and a colleague, Trina Fortune from Isqua, we flew into Rio uh, de Janeiro last night and had the, uh, the joy of uh, being escorted by Jose Noronha through to Brasilia because we wanted to fly over your country. So apologies for a little being a bit late this morning. Uh, thank you so much for your kind invitation. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be here and it's my first time in Brazil, so I'm delighted. Um, and, and keen to experience it for, for the next few days. What um, I've been asked to cover is uh, a number of different aspects around uh, global quality and safety and some of the national aspects for quality and safety. So what, if, if I may, what I'd like to talk about initially is a little bit about ISQA, the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, and what we do, who we are, and uh, there may be a couple of people in the room have, who have been engaging with us uh, over the last number of years. And then, if I may, I'd like to just touch on um, what I think is the core of, I hope, what we're all here to do with the different roles and responsibilities that we have, which is about ensuring that every day to each one of us and our family members, we provide a reliable healthcare service. So what that really means around ensuring that what we do is of an acceptable quality and is safe. So I'm going to touch on some of the, the personal experiences and also some of the lessons that many of us have learned from each other over the years. Then I'd like to touch on some of the global trends that we experience um, from an ISQA perspective. It's here touched on the uh, growing aspect about an aging population and how we run our health services. Are they fit for purpose now and for the future? What does that mean? And what are the trends that are happening globally in the changing population, but also uh, specifically around quality and safety? And then finally, I was asked um, to talk a little bit about what, what I do for a a day job. This is a this is between out of hours job, um, which is a great job. But uh, I head up an organisation that regulates health and social care in the Republic of Ireland, and we also undertake health technology assessments and provide some information around uh, health information. So I just want to share some experience with you around the the regulatory environment around quality and safety. And thanks to our wonderful technicians in passing that password to get through. So thank you very much. So ISQA, um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with ISQA, but we're an organisation that's been going oh, for well, long before I was born, in fact, uh, from 1985. And we moved the secretariat or the headquarters from Australia to Ireland, purely coincidental, uh, a number of years ago. And uh, with that has, has uh, given us an opportunity to engage in even more countries across the world. We're a not-for-profit organization. Um, we are purely about connecting people and providing help sharing and learning to all of us in many countries who are grappling with the same issues, albeit just in a slightly different language. And we have a wonderful board uh, that represents most of the global regions, including um, South America, and we have Jose Noronha, who is one of our board members, who many of you will be familiar with from here in Brazil. So he gives us a challenge and brings a sense of humor and a run for our money, so thank you, Jose. Uh, we also have a number of honorary advisors, and we have a number of board committees, which are really important to us, and we plug into people all around the world, which is a very, very small um, planet, are particularly around core elements of quality and safety, including uh, accreditation, and I'll come on to that. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have someone from CBA who is on our International Accreditation Council uh, from Brazil, and we also have uh, someone from Argentina who is on our editorial committee. So what do we do? Well, we um, have a number of, of, of large pieces of work that are all about quality and safety. One of which is accreditation, which I know is a hot topic for Brazil and other colleagues in South America. And we uh, provide a number of um, accrediting, accredi accrediting awards. Uh, and it's important to, just to emphasize that we don't accredit providers, nursing homes, hospitals, we accredit organisations who accredit those facilities. So we accredit, for example, CBA uh, uh, colleagues in, in Europe, in Australia, who are, if you like, the regulators, the accreditors. Uh, and, and that's done on a, a very much peer-based approach. So some of the accrediting awards we have are the standards that these accrediting agencies use, how they, they assess surveyors, and those of you who are familiar with 
uh, inspection regulation accreditation know that actually you're nothing if you're not training your surveyors up to be a high quality that's where the judgment comes from so very important and also how high performing they are as organizations um, those of us who work in in organizations that assess others have to make sure that we are providing an organization of the highest quality we also have a lot of activities in education. We work very closely with uh, people across the world, including ITSIA and colleagues, uh, and we have uh, developed a, a fellowship in quality and safety, which is growing. Uh, and this is very much uh, an online accessible uh, fellowship that takes people through a qualification, and we're having discussions to customise that for certain parts of the world. Um, Nigeria, in fact, is, is a country that we're in, in detailed discussions with. Uh, last year, we realised that actually... Um, and, and again, it's the touched on this. We're, we're about networking. We're all facing similar challenges. So we and we have phenomenal leaders in quality and safety that we are very honoured to work with. So we established what's called the experts, and we have 70 or 80 people who, some of you who you may know, right across the world with different experiences, who work with us to help other countries and and themselves. A big priority for us in the last number of years has been supporting lower and middle income developing and developed countries. Uh, there are fascinating learnings and there are fascinating rapid developments that are happening in, in developing countries, particularly on the basis of learning um, from those countries that perhaps have, um, have slowed down in their improvement that are slightly more developed. So it's a big, big priority for us. We were uh, in Ghana with 17 countries in a conference uh, earlier in this year. And it, it, is, uh, it is something that, as a board, we've become increasingly involved in and work with colleagues in, in Middle East, in Asia, and, and uh, in fact, we have a team in China for the next few days. So it's an important area for us. And, and in so doing, you realize that actually our challenges are all very, very, very similar. We also have an annual conference, uh, and in fact, Jason Leach, who you're going to hear from later on, has been one of the key coordinators in hosting our conference this year in Edinburgh, uh, which is, is proving to be, a, I think, a fantastic scientific program of learning, particularly around improvement science. And in fact, um, I'm really glad to see all of the infrastructure changes in your airports and uh, roads, because we're actually coming to Rio in 2014, which is even more important than the World Cup. So um, I'm really, really pleased to see that. So uh, the, the annual conference will be, I think, very, very interesting, and I think will be fantastic, uh, hosted and coordinated by uh, CBA and other colleagues. We also have an international journal that uh, we publish lots of different types of, uh, of quality around, uh, from r randomized control trials through to case studies of quality and safety around the world and we also do specific editions. Um, just very quickly, just to give you a little bit of an idea of the presence in South America, those organizations who have gone through uh, the Organizational Accrediting Award, uh, the our colleagues in Colombia who uh, have received that award, CBA is going through it at the moment and I think we have the on-site visit next year. And similarly, ONA uh, is just concluding their accreditation around standards as an organization. I think that's great uh, progress and I'm sure we'll see more and more of that across South America. Finally, in relation to ISQA, um, as someone taught me very, very early in life, people buy people first. Uh, we are about sharing, connecting people. We work with lots of different organizations from local level in countries to um, global organizations. Uh, we work closely with ITSU and colleagues in WHO, and we have a number of memorandum of understanding with other organizations that share different aspects of quality and safety um, to really just try and help uh, each other across the world. So um, that said, that gives you a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of ISQA. Um, what I'd like to just now talk about, it really is, so, so what does that mean? But, you know, for me, it's what do we all come to work to do um, and the good days and the bad days? And, and I really think it really is about, about us, as I said earlier, uh, ensuring, and I think that's an important word, how do we ensure and are assured that we're providing a good, reliable service? And just to give us a bit of context, and apologies, we were late, Itzia may have already done this, but we're no different sitting here in Brazil to Ireland, is where I live, uh, through to France or Australia, where humans 
services every day to, to patients um, and we face what are often the human factor challenges of that. So perhaps just to give us a reminder, in developed countries up to 10% of patients may be harmed while receiving hospital care. Well known statistic, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. The risk of healthcare associated infection in some developing countries is up to 20 times higher than in developed countries. In some countries, the proportion of injections given with needles that are reused without sterilization is up to 70%. And 300,000 people die, this is two-year-old data, in India from dirty syringes, 30% of which are reused. More than 50% of medical equipment in developing countries is unusable or only part usable and can result in serious injury or death and is still used every day. And finally, those of us who flew in, and many people in the room, we're really pleased to say that we have a one in a million chance of a risk for flying, but unfortunately, one in 300 chance of a serious adverse event in healthcare. And it's the common things that we reproduce as errors on a daily basis. Um, I'm often asked, as many people in this room are, so, so what do we do about it? How do we recognize it? What are the key elements of quality and safety? And I used to have about 15 slides that had all of these lists. And actually, the more um, we work, work in our world, the more we realize that actually it's really quite straightforward. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, safety. Uh, I'll come back to this, but in my world in Ireland, we have every donor in the world in, in our beautiful debt and deficit that we have. Um, and so I have every day thrown at me we can't do this because we don't have the money to do it. Well, actually, we would say there is no excuse for unsafe services. So, firstly, get it safe, keep it safe, and then we'll build quality. But quality and safety are actually the same thing. One is part. You can't have one without the other. But when you're trying to move, develop a movement in a country around healthcare, safety is more black and white. It's unsafe. This is the cause and effect of it. It's something that mobilizes people. Quality is something nebulous, but actually it's the same thing. And of course, quality is also about continuous improvement. Reliability to me is the same procedure happening in the same hospital or in a different hospital by the same clinician or a different clinician consistently, reproducibly, every day. And variation is reduced by how we ensure that we continue to improve our services. How do we know that we're reliable? How do we know in Brazil, different parts of Brazil, from Sao Paulo to Rio uh, through to the Amazon, that actually it's consistent in the healthcare that we provide? And all of this is about culture, the feeling of, of an organization that you have when you walk through the door. Uh, and I'm sure everyone in this room has, has good and bad experiences of the jobs that you've had through healthcare or non-healthcare, the openness of the organisation and the preparedness it is to learn. Because if we don't have a culture that promotes learning, there is no way we're going to change those statistics and there is no way that we're going to ensure that we produce a reliable healthcare system. Increasingly, I'll come back to this, we're finding, both for me and my day job, but also um, uh, from an INISCO perspective, the increasing role, which is a fundamental element of in, in tight economic, fiscal, challenging environments, we have to inform our decision making. So what evidence do we use, what data sets do we establish to make sure that actually we can inform all of the above in a way that is going to uh, ensure maximum population health gain. But having said all of that, really, it is all about the patient, the person, the older person in a long-term care facility, this same older person waiting on a trolley for three days in the emergency department, the same older person who's trying to get an appointment with a GP. It has to be all about the person. So our policies that we have and that we set up uh, are nothing if they're not focused around the 196 million people that you have and how we can try and maximise uh, good outcomes for that population. And trying to put all of those into uh, a coherent framework, often, I've been guilty of this, I'm sure we all are, we develop these policies and we develop the procedures and we have these fantastic glossy manuals that we have. We pull off the shelf every now and again when we think someone's going to come and check on us. Um, but actually, the systems and processes are only as good as us as the people who work within them. So as you're setting up policy and we're implementing reform around healthcare services, 
Uh, we have to have the framework. People need to know what's expected of them, what the latest evidence-based practice is. So we need some systems, we need some processes, but actually at the end of the day, our focus should be about how we support each other as humans, because at the end of the day, it's humans that deliver the care to humans. So we have to make sure that as we're driving improvements in health services, that we pay as much attention to the beginning of that sentence as we do the end of that sentence. And just from a, a human factor perspective, all of the serious adverse events that I've been um, involved in as far as investigating, um, been involved in it from a, a national perspective and a local perspective, actually, it wasn't the systems and processes, actually, it was often the human behaviours that caused the challenge. How we communicate with each other as healthcare professionals, as managers, as government officials, as patients, the relationships, uh, many years ago, uh, I worked in the NHS in England, and there was a hospital in um, Wales, South Wales, called Morriston Hospital. And this was a normal hospital providing services to about 350,000 of their local population. And a number of years ago, their cardiothoracic centre closed. And it didn't close because the roof was falling in. It didn't close because they had an overwhelming surge of an infection, a healthcare associated infection that was just too dangerous. It closed because the cardiothoracic surgeons didn't get on with the anaesthetists, who didn't get on with the theatre staff, who didn't get on with the ward staff, such that it was too dangerous for patients. That was about people not addressing the interactions, the relationships, uh, the behaviours that impact on healthcare. The multidisciplinary team working, if people are interested, there's a man called Michael West who has done a lot of research in Salford University around the relationship between effective teams and patient safety. Teams who are not effective, who are ineffective, normally because people haven't managed ad adverse behaviours, are more likely to provide unsafe services than those who are, that are effective. Leadership I'll come back to, but to me, the human elements, how we interact, this is all about the culture of the organisation. Yes, you need the framework, but actually we're the ones that interact with each other. The DNA, the feeling you have when you walk into a hospital and you're feeling vulnerable and how people interact with you. The num a friend of mine, who uh, one of our directors, was admitted, and wasn't very well recently, was admitted in a hospital in France, a lot of communication, flew back, was admitted into a hospital in Dublin three days before a consultant spoke to her. And this is a director of a regulator. Not that that should make any difference. That actually, it was about transactional health care. It wasn't about interacting with the patient, regardless of what their role was. And I think what's fundamental here is leadership. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, are leaders in your own right. If we walk, I don't know how far the hospital in Brasilia is, the closest hospital or long-term care facility, when you walk through the door, they will be leaders in, their, in your reception. There'll be porters who are team leaders. There'll be leaders in healthcare assistance, leaders who will do the right thing for the right reason and who people want to follow. So how as a health system do we promote these people? Leadership doesn't come by job title. These are the people that ensure that the previous slide gets done in a way that is right and correct. And from a national perspective, uh, and forgive me, these are, I suppose, a uh, bit of learning of, of uh, personal learning as well as, as a number of the countries that, um, that we engage with. So what from a health policy perspective and a healthcare delivery perspective does leadership look like? Well, I think with the challenges that uh, we're facing, it really, to me, is about coherence. It's about alignment. And most importantly, it's about the 196 million population you have. That photograph of that lady that we saw earlier. So everything is about that. It's not about the activity. So how we align policy, strategy, the forecasting population trends into a, a slowly but surely change that provides a fit for purpose health system. How we develop our staff. If we don't focus just as much on developing our workforce, we might as well all go home. The policy paper could look fantastic, but if that's not operable, we don't bring people with us, it won't make any difference. Um, and finally, how we liberate the power of the patient. How do we liberate our populations to say, it's okay to challenge the person coming in front of you where you know that they've, gone th they've passed through three patients that they've made contact with and they come into your baby that's, that you're having your arms and they haven't washed their hands. It's okay to do that challenge. So how do we uh, uh, liberate our patients and our public to actually safeguard their own care? So just um, 
taking just a, a little bit of a summary, we've talked a little bit really about the day-to-day -day quality and safety aspects, and then looked perhaps around a, a national perspective. And what I'd like to do now is just chunk us all up to, say, 35,000 feet, um, and, and, and our one in a million statistic, which is very reassuring. Just think about some of the global trends that are happening uh, as we see the world emerging over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And these are conversations that we had on the plane, in fact, with Jose and Trina over here. We were in Asia recently. Same conversations happening in Asia. Same conversations happening in the Middle East. So what is happening globally that, uh, that will impact on how we provide quality and safety in our healthcare service? Oh, sorry. Well, um, these, I'm sure you, you could, if I asked you to write on a piece of paper, you'd come up to the same list. Uh, we know that we have e economic slowdown, and yet we all have our populations to provide services to. So how do we ensure the best use of the resources that we have, because there are only so much, to, for the maximum of overall population gain? It is as it is. So how do we ensure that we adapt that? The globalization of diseases, uh, we know, is a problem everywhere. Uh, and particularly in Asia, is a, is a, is a, is a common conversation that, that takes place. Urbanization. Jose Soros showed a slide of us forecasting changing population density in your main cities. Um, major issue of the development of meta-cities, particularly in Asia. So what does that mean? How do we, how do we provide, uh, ensure that the services go to the community rather than the community has to go to the service? How do we model healthcare where we've got highly concentrated urbanized uh, dwellings and settings? Global mobility. Big issue in some parts of the world more than others. Europe, everybody who is qualified uh, and lives in a member state can work anywhere. Well, that's good and that's bad. Any patient can move anywhere if there's an undue delay. That's good and that's bad, as long as there's a clinical governance framework around it. Medical tourism, how do we adapt to that? Um, changing in healthcare professionals, what do we do to put in place to make sure that we safeguard the population? The aging population is a particular challenge. We've heard this, Itzia mentioned, and I'm sure you'll have it, uh, this will be a popular theme throughout the day, but just, uh, I'm sure, again, you know this, but by 2050, the number of people in the world over 65 will equal the number of children under 14. What does that mean for our taxpaying status further down the line? Who's going to look after the aged further down the line? And also by 2050, the over 50s globally will increase from 1.4 to 3.1 billion, which is significant when you start to think about retirement age, pension, funding, how we keep people for healthier for longer. What does that mean around social care? Many countries, social care isn't particularly on the agenda. Well, it has to be now because actually people are getting older. What's the kind of supports that prevent them from accessing health care? So what does that mean for Brazil? What does that mean for many countries? This is a chart. Um, it take you a few seconds to orientate, but I found this and thought it was particularly relevant. This is a chart that shows the speed of the population aging. So what you have on the top is a timeline from 1860, back in the day, through to 2040. And the bottom blue line is a 7% mark, and the top blue line is a 14% mark. And what they've done, this is a, an N Aging World US census, is look at a number of countries, plot them on the bottom when they were 7% of a population over 65, and then plot them when they became or will become 14% over 65. So you'll see, perhaps not surprisingly, Europe um, was a gradual incline. North America kicked in more recently. Japan, rapid surge, now longest life expectancy at birth. However, those of you at the back who can't see this, this is Brazil. So that's the line of 7%, which was around about 2010, to 14% of your population of 65 and over, around about 2030. You know this, I'm sure. But what does looking at that, what does that mean around how we run health systems? What does that mean around the fit for purpose nature? How do we organize an aging population, keeping them in tax paying status, funding, um, and how we m optimize integrated care? Itzi has covered a lot of this. I'm not going to go through some of these. But what I will say is um, an increasing aspect of we have a finite amount of resources. We have people living longer. Fantastic. So how do we inform our decisions? Why on earth would we be treating 
where there is evidence that why, what we should be treating, sorry, where there is evidence of benefit, and why would we be treating where there is evidence of no benefit or harm, just because it's what professionals have done for the last 35 years. The money is tight, people are getting older, so how do we challenge ourselves to make sure truly informed decision making in how we drive policy and how we use technology um, something that could be through health technology assessments uh, and a short-term investment, but a longer-term gain around clinical effectiveness in the population. So how we project and forecast technology uh, and, and uh, new organisational profiles and models to try and fit that uh, rather steep curve that's happening across the world. So finally, you'd be pleased to hear, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, regulation. It is, as I say, it's my, my day job um, uh, which, which never leaves me, unfortunately. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of, I guess, flavour around um, my experience, but I, I think perhaps resonates with, with many people around regulating, what, what we term is regulating for improvement. You don't regulate just to regulate because it's good to do that and you've got powers. Actually, the role of what we would say as a regulator or an external evaluator and accreditor is to help and play their role in improvement. So um, what I would say is uh, I've come across countries where the regulator thinks that, and I'm sorry, when I say regulator, I'm incorporating any sort of external evaluation organisation, accreditation um, through to licensure, which is more uh, the, the, the role that we have. It's absolutely a core element to implementing policy and safeguarding people. It, it may be independent from, but it, it, it independent in the way it's set up, but it can't be independent from the system. And a regulator should use its tools and functions for furthering quality and safety. Um, per, particular lessons that where there is a lack of coherence between legislation between standards, between guidance. How on earth do, do we expect providers to understand what is required of them? And how can we articulate for people using the service what they can expect? So ensuring that there's a coherence about how we externally evaluate the performance of our health system is key. Um, and that really has to be, I think, about outcome-based. If we're not focusing on that lady in that photograph to make sure that the legislation that sets us up the, the, regulation, the regulations, the standards that have been assessed um, on the basis of should be about high successful outcomes in experience um, and in morbidity and mortality. What I would also say, and I, again I've seen this, is regulators actually focusing on what is absolutely unimportant because they can recommend an action. We have to, in this current climate, focusing on what is important. Don't sweat the issues and put the pressure on something that really is irrelevant. Focus on the big issues that are about keeping it safe. And then supporting people. Increasingly, there's a shift towards what's called responsive regulation. Uh, we've just reorganised, so we have a team who go out and do the regulation. We regulate health and social care, nursing homes, hospitals, etc. And we have a separate part of the organisation that provides guidance, provides improvement science. Why would we not help with our lessons learned? However, if providers don't meet us at the line, we will cross and we will persist and take whatever enforcement that we need. So there's a spectrum of function there. Um, I would also say that there's what we call a safety ripple effect. I don't know how um, colleagues in Brazil are set up with functions. We have statutory functions around investigations. We will always do an investigation, not just about an experience, an, an investigation that tells us, that brings us to recommendations for national learning. So what's the safety ripple effect that through the function of a regulator, greater benefits um, can take place? Really tactical, strategic function. And finally, in relation to regulation, what uh, people may be familiar with uh, reports from the NHS, and many countries have had similar, uh, from the Mid Staffordshire Foundation Hospital Trust, um, where and, uh, the Robert Francis report that's worth reading, published back in February, looking at um, between 800 and 1,200 patients who died avoidably, um, allegedly over a four-year period. And one of the strong issues is regulators not speaking to each other and mind the safety gap, as we would say. So as a country, how do your regulatory agencies work together when they find that there's a dodgy doc or a dodgy social worker or a dodgy um, uh, nurse and they're providing services and the regulator goes in from a health, from a service perspective, identifies this and does nothing about it? How do we inform each other for the greater benefit of patients? So any regulatory framework in a, in a country, I would suggest, really has to add to some of the parts to make sure that we're actually focused on what we should be, which is about patient safety. 
And finally, I, I want to repeat the mantra of um, in difficult times and economic climates that are very, are very challenging and when we're all faced with, but we can't do that because we don't have the money. We can't do that because it's too difficult. We can't afford quality. To, I find myself saying this more and more often. And to me, um, it's, it's quite simple, which is get it safe, keep it safe, and then we'll build quality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Obrigada, Dr. Tracy. You can, you can sit down, please. Nós agora faremos um pequeno intervalo de 10 minutos. Doutora Cláudia solicitou, doutora Cláudia Travassos. Então, um pequeno break de 10 minutos. Eu queria, gostaria aqui de registrar, antes de nós sairmos, gostaria de registrar a presença do doutor Ivo Bucareschi, diretor da Anvisa, que veio do Rio de Janeiro, como eu havia avisado na abertura. E quando nós recompusermos a mesa, o senhor fique à vontade para estar conosco.